great to be with you today. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Leaving Your Legacy Stories About Homeownership. My name is John Millette, and I am so glad you joined us today. We have a special guest for you today. Her name is Lauren Greer. And the reason why I'm bringing Lauren in today is that Lauren is an expert in the title business. Title insurance for homeownership is a really big deal. It's a big deal for real estate professionals who have to have it because the lenders require all properties have title insurance when we do loans. But more important than that, Lauren has an expertise about title that I think will really translate into why homeownership is so important. She'll be able to give you some details that I think that she's really, because of her experiences and her expertise, that she'll be able to give you some guidance and some some ideas that I think will be really helpful. And so, Lauren, it's great to be with you today. Thanks for having me. And you bet, and you've been in the business now 12 years. 12 years now. So you are just amazing. So you do business development and title work with First American Title. Correct. And uh, really good to have you today. Thank you for having me. And the reason why I wanted you here to interview you is a couple of reasons. Number one, you're in my uh, networking group with Provisors, which is great. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I heard you speak about title, I felt like, you know what? Lauren knows a lot more than a lot of other title reps, mm -hmm. right? I have to. Yeah. And so I just thought this would be a great opportunity to just quarter you and get a little bit about your story, you know, who you are, and just try to kind of give a little bit of idea of what's going on. And so I think the first question I have for you is, is that in today's market, mm -hmm. it's a little bit challenging for the real estate professional. The um, homeowners and first-time home buyers are a little bit unsure about whether or not this is a time to buy uh, or the time to sell. And so I think before we get into what your story is, which I'm really interested in, tell me what you're doing right now. What, what are some of the, the challenges that are out there that you see and some of the things that you're doing to overcome those. So I think most people in this day and age know that the challenge right now is people are locked in with their low interest rates and they don't want to move because of the affordability. That's right. They're prisoners in their own. They're prisoners. You, I mean, I hear it all the time. I'm going to die in this house because my rate is so low. Yeah. Um, so right now, I think the way that we're overcoming it is the people that have to move. So we're focusing on divorce, death people moving out of state for board affordability reasons that want to live closer to family. Right. Those are the ones that are really moving right now. Um, we're trying to inform people about Prop 19 and being able to transfer their tax basis so that way older people that have been in their homes for a while know that they can move down and downsize but keep their tax basis. Okay. It's kind we want to talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. You just have to get creative because I think right now with you know, we got spoiled with the rates being so low. Rates are still low in comparison to like what they were in the 80s. But people are used to, you know, short, short term memory. They're okay. used to it. So let's go back to the idea of being prisoner in their own home, because that is really amazing to me. We, we, we're doing some research on that. And it's really interesting to me to know that that the environment that a person lives in is almost more important than their financing on their home, because if they live in a property the question is, are you living in a property where you can move your life forward, right? And people think about that and they go and, and they begin to realize and say, well, wait a minute, because of the way the house is laid out or because of where our bedrooms are in relation to where our children's rooms are, whatever it might be, when a person says, and we believe that there's about 10 to 15 percent of homeowners that are in this position, when they walk into their home, they say, you know, I wish it would be different on the bathroom. I wish the dining room was different. I wish something was different. They're not 100% happy with their current yeah. house. And what do you think that that does to them as far as their their happiness and their, their just working with it to in life in general? It seems like that is an underlying tone, the underbelly, that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. You know... I, I'm in my mid-30s. I have a lot of friends right now who have homes that they thought were going to be stepping stones for their next big purchase. and But all of them right now are remodeling their home instead of going and buying a bigger home. So they're making it kind of what they want it to be or changing the bathroom, expanding, right. adding a room and, and locking in that rate versus going like the, a normal market where they sell and buy up or sell and buy down. People are trying to make it work for them. A lot of ADUs are being built right now to make 
It worked for families that maybe have to move their in-laws in to help with kids. It's just not as much transactions and people. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's yeah. interesting is, is that when they do lines of credit, because the lines of credit are between eight and ten and a half percent. Yeah, yeah. And so when you and they're take, adjustable, right? And so when you take the blended rate as to the rate that they have now, the low rate they have now, and you blend the two, then all of a sudden you're finding that there's a slightly higher rate. Definitely. And so there are a lot of considerations. So refurbishing is really good. Mm -hmm. And then tell me about ADUs. What's happening on that front? So a lot of people are building ADUs to get income to help pay their mortgage. Um, instead of buying a bigger house, they have an ADU in the back where it impre appreciates their property. It makes the property value go higher. A new law just came up, AB 1033, where the potential to sell an ADU or sell uh, separate than the main house and it's two separate parcels. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I, it's crazy what's happening. And they're trying to make home, home ownership affordable for everybody. So I think that's definitely a way. And, you know, out here in Conejo Valley, lot sizes are pretty large. So ADUs on a property, it's not that hard to build yeah. an ADU on there. So so on the, on the new law that's come out, does the... Us uh, owner of the property, are they able to split that and sell that portion of the ADU? Correct. There are some requirements. I there it's it hasn't completely gotten passed. There's still like certain cities that have to approve like everything, but I know you have to have a um like an HOA, like CCNR is almost like a condo complex. Uh -huh. So there are certain re like rec rec required items needed in order for you to do it, but it is putting the idea in people's head to start building ADUs on their properties. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what is your what is your thoughts or what, if you could have a megaphone to all the real estate professionals in the world, what would you be telling them right now? I feel like back to basics and focusing on a niche. A lot of people are kind of confused because since there isn't as much production right now, they're kind of spinning their wheels and they're not staying consistent. So for me, I would pick a niche. I would either do divorces, deaths, empty nesters, where you can mention the Prop 19 and transferring the tax basis and picking an area that you know well and just sticking with it. Because as you know, this industry is a roller coaster. Yeah. And if you're consistent and you're in front of them, it's going to happen. It's just maybe not right now. So I think staying consistent and like really not moving the target is important right now. So tell me about Prop 19. So a lot of older people, like my grandparents, for instance, they don't realize that maybe when they bought their home in the 70s, they bought it. My grandparents bought their house for $90,000. They don't realize that they're in this big house. They can't maintain it. They can they can transfer their tax basis to a home um, in another county even and and not have to. Anywhere in California. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so what is that like? So if their taxes are, let's say their taxes are. $2,000 a year. And some of them are mm -hmm. that low, mm -hmm. even lower than that. Yeah. So that means that they can take that tax base with them mm -hmm. to the new home. To the new home. They have to be 55 or older. It has to be your principal residence. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, you know, it encourages them to move. If they're in a house that it doesn't make sense for them to be in, they could go, let's say, Los Angeles County to Ventura County. They could go from their six bedroom house to maybe a two bedroom house. Let's say it's in a really, really nice area, maybe even on the lake. So it's the same price, but they get the tax basis because they're not working anymore. So they can still age in place. Correct. Yeah. So it's educating people. I mean, I, I've been in the industry 12 years and my grandparents didn't even know that. So it's, you know, I think when you don't do a hard sell and you add value every time you talk to somebody and you are there because you actually care and want to help their situation and right. help them build wealth for their family, I think that's when they... Yeah, it seems to me that if they can move down or... or some kind of a, they can still age in place. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to sell the home. They don't have to go to an apartment. They don't have to go to assisted living. Right. And uh, they can stay in a home that's owned. Right. And I think one of the biggest problems is that when seniors move and they go rent, then what happens is now they have a burn rate of a definite monthly payment that mm -hmm. has to be made, but they don't have any asset that's, right. that's growing at the same time. Exactly. And so that, wow, when the value of the home continues to grow, it just, it's really a better way to do it. Definitely. The other thing that comes up a lot is a step up in basis, like people inheriting property. Tell them uh, about that. I, I was telling my grandparents the same thing. You know, they're both, knock on wood, still alive. They had to move into an assisted living home and they wanted to sell. And I said, this is morbid, but it doesn't make sense for you to sell right now because you're a lot, you're, you know, my, my mom and her sister are going to be inheriting the property and 
when they're both alive, if you sell it right now, if they bought it at $90,000 and now it's worth $2 million, they're going to get taxed. They get that 500000 capital gains, but they'll be taxed on the difference. Yeah. If, I mean... This is horrible, but it's generational wealth. If you if they let my my mom and her sister inherit it, then they get the step up to what the current value is, and they don't get hit on those taxes. No taxes on so, you know, it it's maybe not right now they're gonna sell it, but as a realtor, I know you don't get that sale right now. But you know, if you help a family realize they're gonna save so much money by not selling it right now versus waiting for that step Even up to happen. In their best interest. Right. Still, mm -hmm. still, it's not in their best interest. Yeah, it might be maybe in two years. Yeah. It's it's informing people that maybe right now is not the time, but later on, then they, I think they truly respect that you actually care about right. them. So, yeah. I think that's great. So, I was reading an article the other day, mm -hmm. and the article pointed out, <clears throat> because there's a lot of media out there that seems to be telling people not to buy real estate. Mm. which I think is crazy. I Even though the rates are going to higher, it's still a great time because you actually can get an offer accepted, whereas before when the rates were low, you were not. That's what I'm telling all my friends. Yeah. Get in now, refinance later. That's right. Marry the house and date the rate, right? Exactly. That's right. And so this article talked about how that 90% uh, and 90% of the cities, it's better to rent than it is to buy or simply sorry. because the the price of renting is cheaper than home, home ownership, mm -hmm. right? And I thought about that, and I thought, you know, that is a real injustice that they're doing that. Uh -huh. Because, yes, the payment's going to be higher, but if you can responsibly pay for that payment, right? in the end, you're going to be- You have an paying. asset. Yeah, and you actually have something that you can get an offer. Exactly. On. So tell me what your thoughts are about that. I have always been more of an owner versus a lease type of person. If you're able to do it, there's so many different loan programs now and I think most people are very black and white where they think if they don't have 20% down, they can't do it. There's so many different programs and there's so many different types of properties. You can go to one area where maybe you can afford more or do a condo versus a house. Like use it as a stepping stone yeah. instead of just paying somebody else. You're, they're, you're paying for someone else's mortgage, which I never understood. But yeah, it's their own. Somebody else's house. Yeah, exactly. And they're paying a hundred percent interest rate, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Every dime, every penny goes to money. yeah, exactly. It doesn't buy you anything, right? Other than a roof over your head for the month. Yeah. Okay. So the question I I like to ask, yeah, is how did you ever get in the business? Because people don't graduate from school. They don't. They don't. <laughs> they don't say I want to be in the title. No, I didn't even know that was a thing. Right. So they usually find it somehow, or it finds them. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about your. So I am so blessed because the stars aligned for me. I, out of college, I went to San Diego State. I studied advertising. Both my parents are in sales, so I knew I wanted to be in sales, but I had no idea what kind of sales. And I worked at E-Entertainment, and I hated it. I was in on-air promotions. I was a number out of the, like a million people in the company. And I found, I put my re resume online. A recruiter reached out to me, and he said, I know this doesn't sound glamorous, but I am hiring for a coin-operated washer and dryer company, and I think you'd be a really good fit. And I said, coin-operated washers and dryers, no thanks. And he said, it's like the Nordstrom's of coin-operated washers and dryers. So Nord, he said that word, and I was like, okay, I'll meet you for an interview. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't know any different. I didn't know how hard it was going to be. I covered all of Southern California, and my job was to call on apartment owners and property management companies for coin operated washers and dryers for apartment complexes. Okay. All right. It was That's a quarter. learning experience. Yeah. Oh, the amount of quarters collected. It's cr I had I trained for one day I had to wear a bulletproof vest with a coin collector because there's so much money. And I knew this wasn't going to be my career, but I knew it was a really good training in sales. So I did that for a year and I said, okay, at a year, I'm going to start looking. I was at a networking event at um, El Carrizo Golf Course in Silmar. And I did my little presentation on my washers and dryers. And this man came up to me afterwards and he said, I have an apartment complex. I would love for you to send me some information on the models and the pricing. I was making $25 per machine at the time. So I was like, yes, $50. I just made, I'm going to make 50 bucks. Yeah. And so I sent him and he called me like five minutes later. His name's Scott Akerley. I will always remember him. He's a fabulous man. And he said, I have good news and bad news. I don't have an apartment complex I need washers and dryers for. I ha I own an escrow company called Glen Oaks Escrow, and I need an escrow rep for the San Fernando Valley. 
And I said, well, I live at home with my parents. I don't know what escrow is. I was 20, I just graduated college, 21. And he said, it's okay. We can teach you what escrow is, but you can't teach someone how to sell. And I'm really impressed by how how your follow-up was and you were just very personable. And so that started my career in the real estate industry. And I thank God because I've learned so much from so many people. I mean, that's how most people build their wealth is from real estate. Yeah. So I, I owe him my whole career. Thanks to so Scott. After you, so after you started in escrow, what made it so you transitioned into title? Because that's a, you know. A totally different. Yeah. So title wasn't on my radar when I even was in escrow. Um, I worked with title companies because it goes hand in hand on a transaction. But I had loved the company and I, you know, all my escrow officers had, were amazing. About two years ago, Scott um, at Glen Oak sold his company to First American Title. So it was kind of an easy transition for me. Um, once they were the parent company, I went to them and I said, look, I love that title reps have more tools. They have more a lot of data they can pull. And I love sitting down and being kind of a consultant for real estate professionals. So now I have all of those resources and I feel a lot more involved because I was never the escrow officer. I was the one that would bring business in. Now I am very involved. I review the prelims. Um, you know, I can check if properties have easements. I can look up title if there's any liens, all of that good stuff. So I have to use my brain a lot more. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. So, you know, that's really cool because if you're a title representative, um, isn't it kind of unusual that you would read the title report and you would do all the background work? You know, successful title reps read it because that's when there's red flags that can blow up a deal. But a lot of people don't know how to read it or they assume the escrow officer is going to read or the title officer or the agent knows how to read it. But you'd be surprised how much falls through the crack. Um, so I love having eyes on the files and just kind of giving people like a warning if there's something they need to watch out for ahead of time. OK, so that brings up two questions for mm -hmm. you. First question is um, you're really you're detailed, but you're also creative. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because when I call on you for things, you go, you know, you're right there. Right. Mm -hmm. And so really dependable. Where does all that come from? You know, I think my since my mom was in sales, she would always say, you, you're you a good salesperson if people like you and you do what you say you're going to do and if you're consistent. And I've always been like that. If I if I care about you and I I you're somebody that I trust and that I, I see potential in, like I will I will do anything I can do to be part of the team to make you successful. I see. Yeah. So where does that come from as far as your background you're bringing up? Where is that? Really interesting. You know, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I, I grew up in a very stable household, very reliable parents, very loving, very loving grandparents. I still, you know, when I started in the escrow world, I would call my grandpa every day and tell him how many escrows I got that day that he would like wait by the phone. Okay. Um, so now it's it's title orders. So. Okay. And I think, you know, he's still trying to figure out escrow versus title. I still try to explain it. I just, you know, I have a lot of like raving fans in my corner. And so I think I just want to make everybody proud of me. I think that's what it is. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell me about and title. What are some of the red flags? What are some of the things that you look for that, that you can help us understand so that we can, we won't uh, make those same errors that we can, we can figure that out? Definitely. So a lot of times if there's liens on a property, um, you just want to inform the people because a lot of times maybe the lien has been paid off and it's not recorded on the property. So we have to go to the homeowner and say, do you know, do you have a letter saying that this loan has been paid off? Um, a lot of times, you know, a husband and wife, if they're married now and the, the seller, when they bought the property, they were single, they have to have their spouse sign a prop, an, um, an affidavit saying they, they're aware that they're selling because it's a community property state. Um, a lot of times if there's a death, um, one of the trustees dies and they don't file a death certificate. We have to do that prior to, you know, closing escrow because we have to make sure all of our ducks are in a row. Mm -hmm. We've had HOA issues. We've had plot map issues where maybe like the boundaries on the property lines aren't accurate. So we have to make sure like there's could be neighbor disputes. And I've always found out that the the thing I like about working with title is that I can get a lot of stuff done that normally you'd have to hire an attorney. To. Oh yeah, a but ton. You guys, right? And you know, I've been in the in this world for so long, I don't realize like how much information is at my fingertips. But for the normal person that isn't in this industry, the amount of information we can get is almost scares people sometimes. Really? Because we can we pull back the whole transactional history. You know, a prelim shows all the history of the property. 
So it shows everything. It shows all of the deeds. It shows all of the loans. It shows any time the transfer between, let's say, from a spouse to the trust, back to a spouse. So it, it's like an investigative process for each property. Okay, now I want to go back to one thing that you talked about. You mm -hmm. talked about that you are the type of person that really doesn't like the rental or the lease. Yeah. You like the own. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? And tell me a little bit about that. I think I just was raised, you know, we owned, I owned my car. Um, you know, you, you pay into something that you own. It, you end up owning it at the end free and clear. So... I think I, you know, my I grew up in a house. We lived there 25 years. My, I, I don't, we'd never moved. So it was just stable. Yeah. Um, I, my parents always, my mom always says this to me. I wish I knew you when I was younger, Lauren, because I would have held on to property that we sold that we, maybe we could have figured out a way to hold on to it and buy something else. So we had rental property. You know, I've learned so much because I have so many people that give me advice. I have one of my clients, um, his name's Paul Ling. He's a big multifamily guy. All the commercial brokers know him. He was my biggest washer and dryer client because he needed to buy them from for his apartment complexes. So I talked to him about building wealth. And, you know, if you don't come from money and how you do it with working and commission and, you know, yeah, saving. You're not coming from money. How are you and it's hard in California. It's very hard. It's expensive. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he just said, you know, build wealth, have renters in there that pay your mortgage. If you cash, I mean, in, in California, thankfully, you, it appreciates a lot. In other states, cash flow is more important. And just having, you know, not all your eggs in one basket, I think, is super important. And so how did you go ahead? How, how did you start that process? Because, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about your journey as far as home ownership. So, like I said, I, luckily, my parents let me move back in after college. So I got to save some money and then I bought a condo in Tarzana for my first property and I ended up leveraging that and pulling money out of that to go buy my second one. And then I sold that one and bought a duplex and then leveraged to pull more out. So I own a few out of state and then a few in California and they're all very different. You know, one, two of them are in Lake Havasu. They don't appreciate that much, but the cash flow is there, and it's a lot easier to buy a duplex in Havasu compared to in California. A lot more affordable. What are some of the challenges of being a lamp? Oh, boy. You know, California is not very landlord-friendly, unfortunately. Um, and then with COVID, it was hard because a lot of renters were not, were not paying rent. Luckily, I didn't have that happen. Um you know, I self-managed my properties, and I just remember the day I had my daughter. I was in the hospital, and a tenant called me and said, the gate's not opening. I can't get in. And I was like, I'm having a baby. I, I can't handle this right now. So I ended up hiring a manager because it just was taking up too much of my time. Um, but, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot. You're dealing with a lot of people. And, you know, they say when it rains, it pours. When one person's plumbing breaks, for some reason, the other people's as well. So you just have, you know, a lot to yeah. And so do you still find that it's worth it? A hundred percent. I'm building wealth for my daughter. A hundred percent. So if you were, if you had a, if, if you knew that everybody in the world was going to listen to you, mm -hmm. what would you say to first time home buyers, people that are renting? What would you say to, and by the way, I want to, I want to make it real clear that, that buy the hall may not be for everybody, mm -hmm. right? Uh, at the same time, there is such evidence. I mean, there's so much empirical data that says owning is so much better than renting. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a survey done uh, several years ago that showed that that um, from it was an older survey from 1999 to 2009, even through the subprime crisis, mm -hmm. showed that the uh, that wealth, a renter, their wealth was at $1,500 when it started in 1999. Mm -hmm. In 2009, their, their net median wealth was $1,200. But for a renter, it started at, for someone who bought a home at the same time, mm -hmm. it started at $8,000 and it went to $94,000. In fact, today, um, homeowners, the median net wealth is 46 times greater. Instead of 6,000, it's 230,000. Mm -hmm. So what would you, what would you say to, because right now the media is really just lambasting mm -hmm. renters. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're saying they're scaring. Don't buy now. Yeah, they're scaring it. Mm -hmm. They're they're saying now is not the time because rates are high. You can't afford it. 
I, I mean, you know, how do you, what would be your, your message to them? I feel like it's a long-term game. Like it's a long run. You, you, it's almost like a 401k. You put the money aside because you know it's going to grow. And it's the same for a property. You, you buy a property because you know in 20 years it's going to be worth a lot more, especially in California. I think that, like I said, a lot of people don't realize the options they have. And so if there is a buyer that's curious about it, they need to talk to a lender about what's, what the options and, are. You no, know, that's really an interesting uh, point because the survey was done that showed that 36% of people who rent can buy mm -hmm. and most of them don't know it. Have no idea. And so a lot of realtors, I tell them, you know, I can pull renters, I can pull non-owner occupied homes. If you are targeting buyers, you need to tell them, you can show them what they're spending and what they're what they would spend on a mortgage, but then also you need to show the appreciation. I mean, that's how you build up to the next level is because then when the home appreciates, then you can go and either sell and buy something bigger or pull money out and go buy something else. Right. So you can't do that as a renter. Right. And you know, it's interesting. We had a uh, a couple who recently closed on their first home. Mm -hmm. And they uh, were told by their landlord that their that their rent was going up. Mm -hmm. And they go, you know, what are we going to do? It's out of their control. Yeah, it's out of their control. They're like, they're in servitude, you know? It's the tyranny of, of being a, of a landlord. Right. And what was interesting is, is that they started to look for other rental properties. And then what happened is, is that uh, a friend of theirs, a family member who's a real estate professional, uh, Jeff Landown, mm. He, uh, he basically said, well, you know, by the time you come up with your uh, first and last month's deposit, by the time you come up with all the money that you have to have to move into a rental, mm -hmm. you might have enough for a down payment. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they came up with 3.5% down because that's all. No, it was 3% down. All they needed was 3% down. Mm -hmm. And they went through the counseling and they closed. And they are so happy. And the payment is not that much greater than what the rent would have been. They're lucky they knew Jeff and that he suggested that because most people don't. Or they don't know a VA loan. You don't have to put anything down. It's it's just unbelievable. So I try to spread the word and I try to connect people. I think that's another big part of my job is I talk to so many people. And a lot of people don't know that a title rep isn't a realtor. So like a lot of people are like, oh, you're a realtor. And I say, oh, no, no, no I'm not a realtor. I'm not a lender. I'm, I do the title and escrow side. So once you're in you know, a, a transaction, that's where I'm involved. And so I do a lot of connecting, which is why I'm in provisors. I need attorneys. I need lenders. I need appraisers. I need inspectors. I need all of those people. And I need high quality people that will give the same level of service. So I try to inform people as much as I can and then make the introduction so that way they can get educated because. And I mean, you're, you're, you're a, a, a great example because you've done it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You didn't come from lots of wealth. But you, you, you bought your first property, then you leveraged that for the second, and you have done fantastic. You know, it's funny. I remember when I bought my place in Encino, it was $540,000. This was like in 2014, maybe 2015. And my mom said, I cannot believe you're spending half of a million of do million dollars on a on a 1,700 square foot house. And I said, well, mom, like, I like the neighborhood. I'm just, you know, I want to invest in something. I mean, now it's, it's a million plus. And so I, I, she looks back at me and she's like, I'm glad you didn't listen to me because you can't get in. You can barely buy a closet in that area now for anywhere near that. So you just, you always look at the history and it, it, it always projects a lot more later on appreciation wise. So. Mm -hmm. So in concluding, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you've been with us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. What is it that you want to say? What if, if you knew that everybody was listening to you, what's the most important thing, the essence that you want them to know about Lauren and also what you want them to know in general about the market, homeownership and things? That I think the biggest thing is curiosity. So I feel like I'm hoping this puts like a little bit of a nugget of wonder in people's heads that maybe they didn't think it was possible and they reach out and you know, say, this is my situation. Can I, can you make an introduction? I want to see if it's possible. Um, because, you know, everybody wants to build for their loved ones and, and set them up for success. So I feel like if, if I can help make the connection or, you know, inspire someone, that's all I want. So the curiosity, that, that's great. I love that. So the curiosity is it could be for seniors. Mm -hmm. 
that maybe can buy down to another home or mm -hmm. keep the home they're in and figure out how to make that work. Mm -hmm. It could be with first-time home buyers that have no idea that they can buy, but they really can. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number of people that can buy homes right now that are renting is just incredible. Yeah. And they can still buy responsibly. For sure. And it also applies to the curiosity of individuals who own homes. And want to buy an investment property. Buy an investment. Or maybe put an ADU. Mm -hmm. Just asking the questions, because I, I, I really connect with you on that, because so many people, when they call up, they say, we saw a home we liked. But we know that we probably can't afford it. Yeah, they just assume. They just assume. Mm -hmm. And yet, within 20 minutes, I tell them, yeah, you're good to go. And then they're shocked. Right. Yeah. Uh, literally. I mean, this couple that I, that I talked to when I had the first meeting with them mm -hmm. on a Zoom call, they were just amazed. They, they thought, wait a minute, it's got to be a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. It can't be this easy. Well, and then, honestly, ownership as well for tax purposes you know, my CPA always said, buy property. It helps with your taxes. You'll have a lot more write-offs. And so it, it's like a it, there's multiple layers to it benefit-wise. So I just... And that's a very good point because right now when the rates were low, nobody talked about mortgage deduction because mm -hmm. nobody could really get past the $25,000, right. you know, um, deduction, mm -hmm. right? But now with the rates are higher... We, we did a loan. I did an analysis on uh, a loan that we did. Mm -hmm. The loan was $750,000, and the uh, buyers of that home will get a tax break of $1,500 a month, which is just amazing, mm -hmm. simply because the rates have gone up. Right. So people are really not paying attention that they look at the payment versus rent, but they also are not looking on the at the back end. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you have a trusted CPA, a trusted lender, somebody that you can go to to just ask the questions, I think it's an important start before you get your hopes up. And then you and then it's good news usually. Yeah. Or or a plan for the future to get good news where you're ready to buy later on. Right. At least it's a trajectory. Exactly. Plan. It's a plan, a plan in place. Yeah. Well, Lauren's been great. Thank you for having so me. Much.